Dear ladies and gentlemen from around the world, welcome to this online event today. Um, my name is Johanna Hasting. I'm in the head of the foundation's office in Baden-Württemberg, which is in the south of Germany. The Friedrich Naumann Foundation offers political education in Germany and abroad for those of you who have joined for the first time. With our events and our publications, we help people to, bec to become actively involved in political affairs. We also support talented young students with scholarships, and we have been campaigning for freedom, for the rule of law, for democracy and human rights since our foundation in 1958. Our headquarter is based in Germany and we maintain offices throughout Germany and in over 60 countries around the world. But enough about ourselves. Uh, let's focus on today's event. Um, you are part of an online event series that's called Female Changemaker, with, with which we portray female activists around the world. Those women are leading protest movements in their home countries and fight for democratic change, for, demo for more transparency, for the rule of law. In the last issues of this event series, we have had very moving discussions with women from Belarus, from Poland, from Tunisia, and from Russia. If you have missed these event events, feel free to watch them online. We will post a link afterwards in the chat box um, and you can see the, the links or the clips from the past events on YouTube. Before we start with today's topic and female change makers in the United States, we would like to offer you a short sneak preview, so to say, into a documentary on different women leading protests around the world that my colleagues in the international department have put together over the last couple of months. It's a short movie and it shows prominent women in Belarus, in Venezuela, in Hong Kong and in Lebanon. And we want to show you a short glimpse of that movie, not the entire movie, of course, but a short sneak preview on the activist from Hong Kong. Can we please uh, see the video now? It has always the darkest before dawn, but I believe that any time Thomas will be ready to get back our home. Being a, a woman in the front line is quite scary. People are saying like we might not run faster than the men and the risk of us getting caught is higher. There are rumors about women being harassed. All the rumors only encourage us to do more or let the whole world know. It's just like a game of lion chasing goats. If you didn't get caught, that means someone did. When the movement slows down, they will start arresting people. They just didn't have the time to put evidence together. I still want a home to come back and I will still try to do the best I can until I can't anymore. I think a lot of people will feel the same. Thank you. So this is a trailer. Um, the official release is at the end of July. So please stay tuned. Um, we'll inform you about it. So what's in it today? As I was preparing my introduction here, I noticed that today is the US National Camera Day, also the National Waffle Iron Day, but I think that has nothing to do with today's topic. However, cameras play a role in today's topic. Um, we noticed that there is a shift in American politics and more and more women are claiming their place at the table and therefore also in front of cameras. Last year, more women served as parliamentarians, ministers and heads of affairs in the world than ever before. And the United States is no exception to this trend with women running for office and also winning in record numbers in elections in 2020. President Joe Biden also made US history by choosing the first woman 
and woman of color as vice president and selecting more female cabinet leaders than any of his predecessors. That's also why we chose the title of today's event. So is there a true Kamala Harris effect or can we expect more women also claiming their seats in local and state level politics? Or is this just a single case? This is what we want to talk about today with the following guests. And I'm really happy um, to introduce those two to you. Teresa Mosquera is a third generation Mexican American and came to Seattle City Council in 2017, following a long career advocating for working families. She was named one of the Seattle's most influential people in 2018 for her work. Good morning, Teresa. Thanks for being part of this event. We're really happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm incredibly proud to be here. Next to her is Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner. Is She's the executive director of the Aspen Institute Germany and teaches at the Hertie School in Berlin. She served at the Federation of German Industries and was a board member of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Welcome, Annika. Thanks for, no, Stormy, so, sorry, other way around. <laughs> Welcome, Stormy. Thanks for joining the event and being part of the discussion. Moderating this event will be uh, Caroline Gill, as you probably already know. She's been moderating this entire series. She has a degree in European relations and longstanding experience in intercultural dialogue and multinational networks. For many years, she's been initiating and moderating discussions with international experts. And if you haven't done so, please visit also her YouTube channel where she regularly posts interviews on various political topics. Welcome. Caroline, and over to you in a bit. Um, before we start, um, those of you who have joined our events before know the little game that we want to play with you. We have prepared a little survey because we want to know a little bit more about our audience so that we uh, know um, who is watching this event. So um, our technical support in the back will pull up um, a survey right now. And we would like to know um, what gender you have, from which part of, or from which part of the world you have logged in, as we have been uh, promoting this event um, also in our offices worldwide. We don't know really where you are from, so that would be helpful. Um, and then two questions on the topic. Are you observing a democratic transformation in your home country at the moment? And are you observing that women are increasingly outspoken and visible in politics in your home country. So we'll take a minute um, and please log in your answers now. Okay, we'll give another couple seconds and then I think we can close the survey now. And we'll look at the results. Okay, so we have 75% uh, female uh, uh, participants here today and 100% are logged in from Europe. Okay, so there's not much uh, international, uh, or well, maybe you are from an international background. Anyway, so all of you um, have an, a European background or are located in Europe. Are you observing a democratic transformation in your home country at the moment? Y yes, 50%, no, 13%, and uh, 40, almost 40% say they don't know. Are you observing that women are increasingly outspoken and visible in politics in your home country? 70% say yes. Okay, so that's uh, hopeful for today's dis discussion. Before we start, um, please, uh, dear audience, um, there is a F and A button on the lower half of your screen. Um, please use that button to submit your questions and Caroline will be happy to um, take on your questions later on. Stormy, Teresa, Caroline, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Good evening around the world in the Zoom room or if you're joining and watching via the YouTube link 
um, because this event is live streamed. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, uh, thank you, Johanna, from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation to make this idea come true. Um, it was an idea that started last year and we had already five discussions. It's actually the fifth discussion now on the US, hashtag female change maker. We want to empower and inspire women with this series um, to be courageous, to stand up, to fight for the rights. And this change we are speaking about can start at home, can start at work, and it always starts with a decision. Introducing women from all over the world, we can understand their motivation, learn from the situation, hopefully in their country, discuss solidarity and the power of the moment. So I'm very, very happy to speak uh, with you, Teresa, and with you, Stormy, from US, from uh, Berlin, from Germany, discuss the situation uh, in a very special year uh, after, after the presidential election took place. And um, yeah, my first question, Teresa, um, is to you because um, we, you heard that we spoke with women from Belarus, from Russia, uh, from Tunisia, from Poland. Um, but what inspired you to get politically active and which changes you wanted to make? Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm really um, proud to be here and to have actually learned from all of the incredible democracy that the country of Germany has uh, initiated in the last few decades and really the ways in which your country has helped to create a more representative democracy. I did have the chance to go with the Nauman Foundation um, and want to wish happy birthday to Klaus Garma who took us on a trip over there and really had the chance to visit uh, the country and learn more about the ways in which um, public financing and tax dollars are helping to encourage a more equitable access to democracy. In, um, in just wanting to you know, do some comparisons here, when I had the chance to be in Germany, we don't have the same type of uh, demographic representation in our halls of Congress or in our state legislatures. And in many cases, we don't have that type of representation in terms of number of women represented in elected bodies across our country. Uh, I think part of the reason that I stood up to run for office was I was outraged. Uh, this is now four years ago. So before the Kamala effect, before the Ocasio-Cortez effect, this was us being outraged in 2016 that someone like Donald Trump could actually win office. And I was part of a cohort of elected officials in the year 2017 after the 2016 election when Trump won who were really upset that women's voices, people of color's voices, immigrants and refugees, younger folks, younger workers, members of the LGBTQ community felt like their vote didn't count at the national level. And we stood up in record numbers and actually won in local elections in city councils and county councils um, and begun running for office. And then what you saw in um, the following year, 2018, is a record number of women standing up and running for office for US Congress. That's where you get Ocasio Cortez and Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and so many other people who stood up and ran for office. Uh, part of what has inspired me to run is recognizing that um, when people stand up who look like me, who um, are my age, are uh, people of color, are younger workers, um, people who are going to push against the status quo, and I see them running but also winning, a lot of us think, okay, that could be me. And so then we start to do it. And the reason that that's important is because we bring our lived experience. We challenge the status quo. We say it's not okay to put issues like childcare and paid safe leave and paid sick leave on the back burner. It's not okay to put family leave on the back burner, issues that disproportionately affect women. And now childcare as well um, as a young um, uh, as a new mom, I wouldn't say too young, but as a new mom with a young kiddo um, having access to childcare in our country, um, as folks may know across the globe, we have an incredibly um, inequal, unequal way to access childcare. It costs almost as much as it costs to um, rent or own your home. And it costs around, you know, over a thousand dollars a month just to have childcare. So 
we're getting into office and we're shaking up the status quo. We're pushing back on issues that have we've been long been told that, you know, you can't touch that or that's not possible. And we're making changes. And um, one of the first things that I did when I came into office was uh, fight for uh, women to have access to bereavement leave uh, for the loss of a child. Uh, it's not something that had been even offered before because family leave policies and sick leave policies didn't cover it. And I had women within the city of Seattle who came to me and said, you came in saying that you're going to represent issues that have been long put on the back burner. Here's what we're having to deal with. And we pass that law like that as soon as I got into office um, and much more to do, obviously, but excited to be part of a cohort of waves of years of people saying, I'm not going to sit back and wait for somebody else to speak for me. I can get into office and speak for myself. Thank you very much. But it was not clear until the end that Joe Biden will win um, the elections. So there are also opponents. Which challenges you personally faced in your ca career? So what type of challenges have I faced in my, in my career um, prior to election and also in office? OK. Um, well, some of the issues that I have worked on before getting elected, I worked for Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, which represents um, trade unions, everybody from construction workers to nurses and, um, and teachers, everybody in between. There's about a half a million workers in Washington State. And even with that type of power, which pales in comparison to the type of unionized power that um, I know uh, the Germany economy benefits from, we still would go and knock on doors and ask for people to pass things like minimum wage increase and paid sick leave increases. And we were told not this year, maybe next year, even with that type of people power behind us, we were told it wasn't possible. And so I think part of the challenge was really trying to elevate issues that disproportionately affect women, low wage jobs, lack of access to housing security are two of the main issues that disproportionately affect women. So getting into office, I was able to then say, we're not gonna ask anybody else to do this now. We're actually gonna pass policies that can have a disproportionate positive impact on women. Um, and I've been really proud of that. Stormy, I want to bring you in. Um... Theresa mentioned uh, a lot of deficits in the U.S. concerning um, not only women's rights. Um, perhaps you can you could comment on that. Uh, what you observed during the last years, and in which way this political Political biography of Teresa is perhaps ordinary, extraordinary. Uh, from for women, you met, uh, you was. Um, Caroline, I think the uh, the connection is um, a little bit spotty, um, but I hope it's not on my side. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, first of all, I have to say, I mean, it's quite obvious that Teresa is extraordinary, and that her. <laughs> <laughs> that that you two Risa, don't have an ordinary um, CV, but you um, you have been one one of the uh, role models, one of the fighters, and at the forefront of female change. So, um, Caroline, the answer to that question is pretty easy. Um, well, Teresa is extraordinary, or not not ordinary. Um, do you, um, probably you all remember that uh, the, the saying, the phrase, uh, we have a binder full of women. Do you remember? I do remember because I thought I couldn't believe my ears when uh, back then in 2012, Mitt Romney um, was saying that when he was asked in the second US presidential debate, how his team would look like. Um, and then he said um, to this question, um, will you have a lot of female representatives in, in your team? He said, well, we have a binder full of women. And I thought that, this, I mean, come on, there's more than a binder. There are a lot of women. Um, and I think that, that the time really has changed um, over the last four years, but there are still a lot of deficits. And um, I looked up just a few numbers, which I wanted to share with you, um, just some statistics um, in the US um, on, on politics um, and gender balance. Um, and I was surprised, I have to say, when I saw these numbers. So female, it's, it's, uh, and it's not, it's not 
before the last elections, after the last election. So this is data from 2021. So it says that only 24% of senators in the US Senate are female. It says that only 27% of US House, House, of, House, US House of Representatives representatives are female. So statewide elected executives, it's only 30%. State legislative seats, which are which are female politicians hold are 31%. Um, with regard to majors, ma ma mayors um, in cities with a population over 30,000, it's only 23% who are female. And then the last one is of those who are US presidents, it's zero. <laughs> we have a Obviously, we have a female, or you have a female vice president now. Um, but this struck me as, as rather underrepresented in politics. And then I thought, hmm, probably it's a lot better in business. So I looked up something like similar from the uh, hierarchy level. So I looked at board seats among the nation's largest publicly traded companies. And it's also only 22.6%. 20, um, and so I think while there is a lot going on, there is still a, a, a really long way to go um, until there is really equal representation um, in, 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 in politics. And um, this, is, this is pretty pretty similar here in Germany as well. Um, among board members um, of big companies, we are a lot worse, I have to say. I mean, they're the numbers, the US numbers look even, even pretty good <laughs> from our side. I think we are a little better with regard to um, female representation in, in politics, slightly better, um, but there's still a long way to go. And um, I also hope that we have the opportunity to talk about how women were affected um, uh, due to COVID because this, this poses a huge challenge and, and I think there's a lot to do. And I hand back to Caroline and Teresa. So I hope you can, you can still uh, hear, hear me. I hope, Stormy, you can. Uh, he's is ha have, have has been done during uh, during this with now more than hundred years of the Joe Biden administration uh, to face uh, to face these inequalities. Did this was a question to me, Carolyn? Yes. 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 Okay. To you. <laughs> Um, well, I think it's it's a little early um, to to say what uh, uh, President Biden has done so far, but I mean what. I mean, just just his team um, putting together an administration which is so heavily female oriented um, and diverse. I think that in itself, it's it's a really strong signal because you need role models. Um, you need some. You need to to see that this is something which can be achieved. And especially looking into the transatlantic relationship, there are a lot of female transatlanticists who are going to hold or are already holding really central positions. For, for example, uh, Karen Donfried um, from the GMF. Um, she is now going to be at the State Department responsible for not just for the Europe portfolio, um, but being at a central position in the administration. And there are so many, um, the, uh, the, the next NATO ambassador being female and so on. So I think that that is a really strong signal. And then looking at the um, at the proposals on the table, maybe the infrastructure package with lots of education in there, healthcare, but also the family cares package. I think there's a lot in there which is really vital um, to improve gender gender equality. But it if but if that actually gets passed by Congress, I think that's a different matter, and that's something um, I'm sure to, to, uh, Teresa is much better better equipped to judge than I am. Theresa, our event's name today is the Kamala Harris effect. Is it overrated? Um, well, I, I think that it's inspiring. I think that there's a lot of people who are inspired by having a woman in the vice president seat. I think that there's a lot of people who are inspired by having a woman of color specifically in the president in the vice presidential seat. I also think that there's a lot of people who are inspired by the number of women who ran and the number of people who color who ran for that highest office in um, America. I don't think that it is um, 
an overrated level of excitement, but I think that it also predates this last election, which was sort of what the point I was trying to get at earlier. We've been clamoring, we, people of color, women, folks who are in the labor movement, younger workers, clamoring for more seats of power. And often people are told, you need to wait your time. You need to get just a little bit more on your resume. It's not your turn, it's this other person's turn. And I think finally, within the last five or six years, people have sort of had this recognition, especially women, it is our time. We are ready, we are qualified. The lived experience that we have actually matters for how these policies should be made. And I should be able to stand up and run for office. Now, I think what's important though is how we make that possible, right? How do we make the next Kamala Harris possible? How do we make sure that there's another AOC coming. And I really appreciate this, that Stormy pointed out, you know, currently we all applaud our U.S. Congress for having the most amount of women it's ever really had, but that's at 27% of the entire body. And then we also applaud ourselves for having more diversity in Congress, but the total makeup of Black, Latino, Asian Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans in U.S. Congress right now is 23% of Congress. So that is a complete misrepresentation of our actual makeup of the electorate, right? That's not a representative democracy and that's still the end goal. I think that's our guiding post that we should be working towards. Now, why don't we have as many folks potentially in Congress or in our state legislatures or even in local government? I think it's that our systems here, especially in the United States, haven't created the pathways for success. In fact, in 2010 and 2012, out here in Seattle, in the Seattle Times, our largest newspaper, the headlines for 2010 and 2012 read that Washington State's legislator, our you know, parliamentary body, it was older, whiter, and wealthier than the general population because they were paying wages of about 40 to $45,000 a year. Now it is very expensive to live out here in Washington state and you cannot have a living wage at $40,000. And so who ends up running for office? Folks who are independently wealthy, people who are potentially retired, people who have the flexibility with certain corporate jobs, like maybe being an attorney, that afford for them to be in office. So it's no wonder that the makeup of the legislature and our, and our local elections don't look like the actual population that they are intended to serve because they need to have jobs in order to pay their rent and pay their mortgage and childcare. And it's even worse at the local level. I'm, I'm fortunate in Seattle that we have a living wage job to accompany a full-time uh, legislative body for the city of Seattle. But but our counterparts in cities across this country, they only pay them $1,000 a month. So you end up again with those same demographics. And when, and I'd love to get to Stormy's question as well about the impact of COVID. But even before COVID, you had especially women who were experiencing this giant and growing wage gap between um, men and women and between folks of color and those who are white in this country. And the sheer fact that we don't have good living wage jobs for everyone out here, especially for women and people of color, especially the gender and the race gap that we see experience, it is no wonder that we still continue to see a deficit in terms of who's in office. But we can change that, I think, by making sure that there's more financial support for those who are getting into office, creating pathways for people to run. Like my former boss at the State Labor Council, he said, yes, you can run and we're going to make it possible for you to keep your job while running and provided that support so that people like me, could run for office. And then we also finally in Seattle have uh, democracy vouchers, which are these little um, checks that basically get mailed to everybody in Seattle, $100 worth of checks that uh, the, the government, the city government sends to every registered voter so that you can give those to candidates of your choice, which makes it even more possible for folks who are not independently wealthy to be able to run for office and have more diversity in terms of who steps up. So um, I think it's a, it's a myriad of factors, but I wouldn't say that um, it's a flash and it's a I wouldn't say that it's a point in time moment of excitement and then we're gonna see those numbers decrease. We just can't see them continue to slowly increase in terms of um, gender representation in Congress. We need to see it spike up so that we can truly have that representative democracy more quickly. 
you are so fully motivated in the, uh, your political office. And I want to, uh, to ask you, do you said uh, we are ready, uh, so the women are ready. Uh, it's the time now um, to, to be in the offices to run. Um, to run for 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 candidates and um, yeah, but but can you tell us perhaps a little bit more about who are the opponents? Um, so I think sometimes, especially for women, the first opponent is self doubt. It, there's a statistic that, especially in, in um, the United States, it takes women seven times to hear, hey, you should run for office before we even consider running. So for everybody who's out there listening, you should run for office. And if this isn't the you know seventh time you've heard it, just repeat this seven times so that you get there by the end of this show. Um, so the first thing is, you know, knowing that all of the um, maybe imposter syndrome or the self-doubt that folks have walking into your room, let's just throw that out the window. I feel like the last four or five years, we have seen people who are, you know, younger than me, who have um, just come out of school, who are saying, hey, I got the credential, Step it, stepping up and running, and they're winning. It's not just running, right? That's inspiring too, but running and winning so that we can make those policy changes. Um, so the other opponents, I think, are folks out there who, frankly, want the status quo. And I am a progressive labor Democrat here in Seattle, Washington. That means that I'm going to come in and make sure that I'm fighting for workers' rights and better taxation policies. I want progressive taxes. Folks probably know how inequitable our tax system here is in the United States, but specifically in Washington State and that Pacific Northwest corner where we have Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, we do not have an uh, income tax and we don't have a corporate income tax. And until this year, we didn't have a capital gains tax. And in the city of Seattle, we have so much need in terms of housing and support for the homeless, folks who need childcare and small business support. We had a 20% increase in our population in just the last 10 years, and we sure didn't have a 20% increase in revenue to create additional housing and support. So I came into office and I fought for our progressive payroll tax for the largest companies with $7 million in payroll who and on the, on the salaries of over 150,000. So it's a progressive, progressive tax and asked for folks to pay a small amount towards helping things like social infrastructure. Now, who's going to oppose um, a candidate like me? A lot of folks from you know, larger businesses uh, definitely oppose me, but we had people power. We had every single women's health group, every environmental justice group, every labor union, and all of the social um, uh, housing folks who said, yes, I like her agenda. And we had voters who said, not only do I like what she's saying, but I got these dollars in hand and I'm gonna send them to her. And that outweighed the traditional large deep pockets that are going to basically push for status quo candidates. And I won in four years ago and I'm running for re-election right now and looking like um, I'm, I'm far ahead of the opposition right now. And I think that's in large part due to the people power and folks seeing when she got into office, she didn't just sit back. She delivered on those changes, especially for issues that affect women and people of color. A question to both of you, what can women do better in politics than men? Teresa, let's start. Oh boy, I was hoping Stormy would jump in first. <laughs> um, you know, I think that when, one thing it's important for us to recognize that representation matters and um, putting aside whether or not um, a individual who identifies as male or female overall can do better. I think when women and we get into office and we bring the lived experience of having earned only 80 cents on the dollar compared to men, and especially as women of color earning around, you know, 60 and 50% to uh, uh, of the dollar to every white man's dollar, we have that lived experience. Now as a mother and looking for childcare, I have the experience of being on wait lists for a year and a half until we got into childcare. I had um, a pregnancy and then we had a miscarriage and then we got pregnant again and then we had a baby. And then that baby was 14 months old by the time I got a call for childcare from one of the places. That's the experience of women in this country who are looking for childcare. And having that experience and knowing that, that stress 
Um, and I feel relatively privileged because I felt like I had good economic support and, um, and we had family around to help out, but there's so many families who don't. Having that experience, I think helps legislators better come up with policies, better legislate and better hear those who are calling and saying, this is the crisis out there. You don't have to be a mother or you don't have to have um, been a woman and you don't have to have uh, that same uh, lived experience as the other woman next to you. But knowing that someone is in office who potentially is going to pick up the phone and call you back or take your meeting is really important. And I think that that's why representation matters. Now Stormy had a little bit of time <laughs> to think about this. Yes, to think about. And, <laughs> and what I wanted to under, underline or underscore um, is something which uh, Teresa said earlier. Um, it takes women seven times more to accept the challenge to run for office, and for this, I think you need role models. So, so a woman can be a better role model for a woman than a man because, um, well, we can see that somebody actually made it um, in maybe some sometimes um, also difficult, difficult circumstances. And I'm not saying that um, male politicians cannot be wonderful mentors. They can be, I mean, really. But um, you need to have, I mean, you need to have role models. You need to see that it's doable and um, to develop the confidence that it is actually compatible to run for office, to have a politician's life, which is really demanding and have a family if you want to have a family, um, that, that that is doable. And I think this is something which, which for, for this, you just need, you need to see that 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 is something which can be achieved. Um, and I think the, the second thing is, is um, as Theresa also, also mentioned, it's sometimes easier for a woman to address the, or to talk about the challenges with another woman. Um, so to point out um, how difficult it is to get childcare or how difficult it is um, to actually do balance having a small child, a baby and a job at the same time. I mean, because you are, I mean, our maternity leave is relatively long, I mean, in comparison to yours, so we are really privileged, but how to balance this um, and um, how to, um, I mean, this is, this is sometimes easier to talk to a woman um, and to, uh, than, than instead to a, a male politician. So I think there are many, many aspects which, why it makes, well, Plus, I mean, diversity in itself is really, really good for creativity and decision making. And I'm not saying just gender uh, diversity, but really, or gender balance, but really diversity. I mean, we, there's so many studies out there which show clearly that companies with diversity perform better than companies without. And I'm, 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 I'm hundred percent positive that's the same for for policy making. You need different perspectives to make good policies for everybody. Otherwise you have a really strong bias in there. Um, if, it, if it is male um, dominated, higher income and white, then there are a gazillion white, black, uh, no, blind spots, blind spots in policy making. So diversity in general is something which is really something which needs to be um, aspired for any good decision making. Can I add to that really quickly? Of course. One example that's, that's so um, so matches what Stormy just said is our lack of paid family leave policies here in the United States, right? Folks know that we're one of the only countries without actual family leave for if you have a baby or if you get sick. Now in Washington state, um, about 12 years ago, we actually passed policies saying everybody has a right to paid, uh, to family leave but it wasn't paid. So it didn't actually help a lot. So we spent 10 years, 10 years fighting to get that policy to have actual funding associated with it. When we saw the change in the um, state legislature in our parliamentary body that is supposed to be coming up with funding and policy, when we saw the changes de in demographics after 10 years of fighting and different elections to get more representation in both by people of color and women, we finally saw that policy pass. Now we are so excited out here because we have three months of paid family leave at a certain percent of your income, but we're one of the only states, one of the few states that actually has paid family leave within the United States. And I think that's a really great example of where we saw the tide start to start to shift once we got over a certain threshold of more representation of women and people of color. Um, and that's been, you know, 
tremendously beneficial, not just for women, but also for, for working families across the board. And, um, and now it's like one of the things that I hear about the most people are so thankful about that policy at the state level, but yet we don't have anywhere near what most other countries have with six months to a year of, of paid leave or more. Stormy, concerning these topics, uh, which best practices from Germany you would uh, recommend to be implemented in the US and perhaps the other way around too? Um, well, first of all, I would under, un, un, underscore why um, <laughs> um, why we are pretty good at doing something. We are, I mean, we also have huge deficits, right? Um, I mean, for example, um, it's also not so easy to get childcare um, here in Germany, um, and um, especially, I mean, it's it's a little bit. It depends a little bit from city to city. But I do have lots of lots of uh, friends who started um, to apply for for a place um, in in a um, early childcare facility, kindergarten, way before the child was born, um, and um, this 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 is also an impediment uh, here or a stumbling stumbling block where we have to work on. The second thing I would say is um, where we can do better is. Um, maternity leave is great. Paternity leave is, I mean, we also need to make sure that the dads also um, have the ability and possibility to also take leave to, um, to, to, to have the same experience, really. Um, and that there is still a little bit of an unbalance um, in there. And then I would say it's our workplaces are still not super, super, um, family or kids friendly and our uh, laws aren't either. Um, we have very, which is good in a sense. I mean, we have a lot of um, laws which protect uh, workers and workers' rights. For example, um, we have a limit to working hours, which is 10 hours. And then we have a requirement um, that um, you need to have a certain amount of hours between the end of a working day and the start of the next working day. Um, a pause, so to say, to recuperate <laughs> from what you did, which also makes a lot of sense. But what does not make sense is that this creates a lot of inflexibility with regard how you structure your day. So you cannot really take a break in between um, your working hours, uh, to get your kids from school, um, take care of your kids and then doing evening working hours and then start again at nine or 8.30 in the morning because then you would violate the law that you didn't take the hours of pause in between your working hours. And there we, I think we, um, we need to develop more flexibility in our labor laws, which are still, I mean, still protecting um, the workforce and the individual, but giving enough flexibility so that you can really, um, uh, really align your working life and your family life in a more flexible way. And, um, and, and some countries are a lot better than that, uh, than, than we are. For example, the Northern European countries, Sweden, for example, and, and other Nordics, they are much more um, flexible. And maybe this is something which we, um, because during, during the COVID crisis, we have developed a little bit more flexibility, not legal, legalized yet, um, but still, I mean, there were some learnings um, and I hope that we now put this into, into action. And there are a lot of, a lot of um, business representatives. I just had the opportunity to talk to Janina Kugel, um, former Siemens uh, uh, representative um, about this and, and lots of um, female politicians as well, who are really trying to drive, um, <laughs> drive reform towards more flexibility um, to, well, to better align working and, and, and family life. Therese, I use, um, said at the beginning that uh, you had the opportunity to come to Germany and to visit, um, to visit the country. Did you take some ideas back to the US concerning women's rights um, or best practices you are implemented? Well, one thing that just really stuck out from our trip was the difference in campaign financing, right? I held up these democracy vouchers because this is our local way of trying to push back against large political action committees, these PACs that are formed in the United States that are basically 
endless deep pockets of funding that mostly large corporations put money and money, money into. Uh, I think people were very surprised on the trip that I was out there to say that to run for office in my first election for city council, it was almost half a million dollars. Half a million dollars for a city of Seattle position is just jaw dropping and it should be right because that's a lot of money and what I understood from and and please do uh, help make sure that I understood this correctly but what I understood from um, the conversations that we had with a number of folks from Kiel down to Berlin was you know that concept is just so foreign when it it seems like the tax structure that you currently have allows for each party to have a small amount of money to support various candidates that to me seems like a really equitable way to make sure that more people are potentially getting a footing into how to run for office and um i'm really i'm really proud of these democracy vouchers we fought very hard for them out here as a way to push back against these large packs and these you know large corporate funding efforts that really pay for candidates to get elected. But this isn't the end goal, right? If, if the goal was through our locally financed democracy vouchers was to get more diverse people to stand up and run for office, check. I was one of only, I was, I was one of eight people to run for office the first time around. And um, of those eight, there was only one straight white man. The rest of us were women, people of color, younger folks, which is like the goal. Now, if the goal of these things was to help more people donate to candidates and have diversity in who's donating and make sure that it's not coming just from wealthy neighborhoods and individuals, then check the box because those democracy vouchers really showed a complete difference in terms of who was donating the neighborhoods, lower income folks, folks of color, um, the students, more people that were donating to campaigns for the first time, not having to pay a penny out of their own pocket, but through these through these vouchers, got people excited about the elections and got them engaged. And, and that carried through to the election voting and more people voted. But if the goal was to get money out of politics, which is a good goal that we should all be working towards here in the United States. It didn't actually accomplish that because my race in 2017, I had to raise the same amount of money as my predecessor who didn't have these. And that's a lot of money that could be going to a lot of other things, important things like childcare and other ways that we can make our community more equitable. Um, so one of the things that I would love to take back is to continue to learn about how we can move towards a system that helps to recognize everyone benefits from participating in democracy. And that's why I thought it was so powerful to hear that your taxation system and the small allotments that are going to parties help to create that civic engagement, that civic life that I think um, could pot be potentially helpful in getting more people to run for office and creating a more level playing field. If I may also jump in, um, something which I learned from your system, because I had the opportunity to um, intern a couple of times uh, with David Barnier, um, former, former Democratic whip um, in, in, in Congress um, and from Michigan. And um, I had the opportunity to intern du during an election campaign. And what was completely foreign to me was actually the, uh, the concept of canvassing going from door to door and talking to people about the um, about the election program and what he was um, promising or what, what his agenda was. And um, there I was as a um, pretty young German student with an obvious, I mean, German accent, going around from door to door um, uh, asking for people's support for David Bonnier. It was really um, a great experience for me because this, I mean, people here in, in a city um, if, I mean, that would be very foreign that people would come to your door and asking for the endorsement of a certain politician or that politician, um, what David did at that time was he took a hiking trip through his, uh, who, through his um, district um, and having lots of barbecues, breakfast in, in people's gardens, saying hello. And then we also had this, this ice cream, um, ice cream van going around. And it was so different to how we do campaigns here. It was a lot closer to people, I would have, to, I would say. And that is something which um, I think it's now also changing. I mean, not during the COVID time, obviously, but before this, that there is um, a greater connectivity between the policy politicians um, and also the people. I think that is something which I took away back then. I mean, long time ago in 2000, 2001, which I thought this is, this, this is, this is amazing um, going door to door. 
And, and that's actually been, um, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's such an interesting comparison. Um, Cause I think we are used to folks coming around and knocking on your door, ringing your doorbell and saying, hey, I'm Teresa, I'm running for city council or I'm working with this campaign. Uh, we'd love to have your support. But you know, these have actually changed that process as well because folks get these delivered to their homes. So I would go door to door and ring the doorbell and introduce myself, talk about why I was running and then say I was a democracy voucher candidate. And I had so many people four years ago say, no one's ever come to my door before. You're the first candidate. Hold on just a second. I like what you're saying. And they'd go to their kitchen table and they'd pick up their vouchers and they'd hand them to me. And that means like in a three hour window of doorbelling or canvassing, I could walk away with $700 in democracy vouchers. But more importantly, folks saw me at their door and they had not seen a candidate there before. And so it changes the, um, I think the approach that candidates can take if they are truly trying to connect with voters instead of sitting in a dark room, you know, dialing numbers that I'm for people I've never met because they happen to have a large pocketbook. I was actually at the doors and meeting people. And then I had people call me when I got elected and say, Hey, you came to my door. Remember we talked about the lack of access to affordable housing. I want you to know about this housing platform that's causing skyrocketing rates of rent. And we actually changed policy within the first month that I was there because of some students who remembered me coming to their door door. And so that's a great way, I think, to show like how we can take some of the benefits of having those conversations at the door and actually make them more meaningful um, for folks who've never really been reached out to before so that you're not just knocking on the doors of people who have voted in the past or donated in the past, and you're going to new, new voters and new donors potentially. Dear audience, you can also submit the questions just write to us uh, using the F and A function. Um, and then we can take in your questions because I think this is the, the right time for your questions also. Uh, in the meantime, Stormy, you mentioned already the consequences, the effects of the Corona crisis uh, of the COVID pandemic, uh, especially if it's about the, con the, the effect on women, perhaps, um, you can you can um, yeah you can elaborate on that uh, what you are observing. Yeah, I would love to, um, and I actually would like to start with a Kamala Harris quote, um, which I looked up earlier, and she said, um, "I think that the pandemic has has exposed the failures, the fractures, the fissures that have long existed in our society, and it has made them bigger and more obvious." Um, and I would I would agree. Um, so again, um, uh, I brought along a few statistics, um, and one is um, of a OECD um, uh, OECD finding, and it it, uh, it found that in 17 out of the 24 OECD countries, um, an overall increase in unemployment, I mean, not surprising, was observed, and women were the most affected. And McKinsey did a really interesting calculation, and they said that. Um, in a gender regressive do nothing scenario. So where we do not address um, the, the imbalances and the negative impact of, of COVID-19 on women, if that is, remains unaddressed, global GDP in 2030 would be $1 trillion below what it would have been if COVID-19 had, had affected men and women equally in their respective areas of employment. So this is this is really dramatic. I mean, it shows, um, those two numbers show that there is really, um, it, 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 it doesn't only have an impact on a personal level, it impacts our whole societies, our, our world with regard to prosperity um, for the future and not just for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but in a time frame of, of uh, 10 years. And what I've found also very striking is, um, Another finding by the OECD, those countries which had large gender gaps before the COVID crisis were more affected than those which had less, less of a gender balance. Um, and I looked up female, um, female labor force participation rates um, in the United States. And what struck me there that, um, that, that there is quite a big, I mean, even before the crisis, there was quite a bit of a gap. Um, female labor force participation um, in uh, 2020, January, 
um, was 57.8% uh, for women, and it was 69.3% for men. So this is this is quite a quite a difference, and um, it went down quite a, uh, it went down more um, for female labor uh, force participation during the crisis. It now bounced back, but it's still not on the same level. For uh, women, it is 50, 56 percent. For men, it is currently six, 67 percent. So this is this is really really a gap. So it's. Um, it's, it's really evident that um, women, women were hit harder by the crisis, are bouncing back less fast from the crisis, and the gender gap has increased um, during the COVID crisis. And that um, makes a really, I mean, a strong case for policy action um, to address this problem very, very quickly. Teresa, what do you hear from women um, on the streets from your voters? Um, well, one of the things that we continue to hear here, especially in the United States, is that this was a she session, not a recession, but it was a, a she session in terms of women disproportionately being affected um, by either lack of a job, lack of childcare, or the fact that they still, especially as women of color, were expected to go to work and put their life and their family's life at risk for exposure to COVID because they were more likely to work in the service sector. Um, all of these factors, what I'm hearing from folks is that they don't want to return to normal, that we can never go back and have a goal of having the inequitable income and the inequitable access to childcare and the inequitable access to housing security that we had pre-COVID. And um, Stormy's absolutely right. And that quote from Vice President um, Kamala Harris is, is spot on as well. We know that part of what COVID did was expose the inequities that were there far before COVID, but have basically pulled back the wool so that we can not ignore these issues. And we have to address them directly in order for our economy, our entire economy to rebound faster. We know some of the best practices, for example, from the 2008 to 2010 recession, local governments, state governments that engaged in austerity budgeting that cut public services in a way to save money, actually prolonged recession that actually harmed local private businesses. And we saw the consequences of that continue to play out for years afterward. What we did in Seattle because of that progressive jumpstart um, payroll tax that I mentioned that I passed, we actually prevented austerity budgeting in the city of Seattle. We were able to maintain city services, which were so important for especially folks who were losing income, we didn't have access to food security and housing security. We were able to maintain that. And then with the bill that um, uh, Vice President Harris and President um, Biden just signed that Congress passed for the American Rescue Plan Act, instead of plugging budget holes with those dollars that finally came to Seattle, we were actually able to build on top of that, provide child care assistance. So $8 million going into the child care industry just in Seattle. We're providing rental assistance dollars. We're providing support for our smallest businesses, especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color owned businesses. And specifically for those who are affected by COVID disproportionately, which includes women and people of color, we're doing cash assistance dollars, not at the scale that it needs to be, but recognizing that folks who are uh, living on the margins know best what to do with those dollars. And I think that it's important for us to do that because um, not only for the statistics that Stormy shared about women, but especially for folks of color, people of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, and especially because, as I mentioned before, they're more likely to work in already low-wage jobs and work in the service sector that was hit very hard from this. Um, so for example, in the United States, African-Americans, um, were 22% of the cases of COVID and Latinos um, composed about 34% of the cases of COVID. But you compare that to what the population actually is. African-Americans only represent about 13% of our population and Latinos about 18%. So it's such disproportionate impact on those who not only contracted COVID, 
but died from COVID, family members that died. So we need to be centering our response to COVID investments and making sure that those communities who've been disproportionately impacted from COVID have direct assistance. And in doing so also recognize they were already disproportionately impacted by lack of access to economic stability, housing stability, um, good living wage jobs and high quality food in this country. And let's make investments that put us on a path to more equitable recovery so we don't return to that post so we don't return to that pre-COVID quote normal that that wasn't inequitable and should have never been normal in the first place. If I may 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 add one one more thing, um, if, I I really liked what you said earlier, Teresa, with the um, seven times more thinking about running for office, and and I found um, a statistic again that one in four women are considering leaving the workforce or downshifting their careers versus one in five men. Um, and that, that again shows that, that women are a lot more, I think, self-doubting um, and the reaction being, I will downshift or I will leave the workforce. And I think this is, we, we, need, to, we need to have policies and frameworks and an environment in place where not one, we're not four in, uh, sorry, all those women, four, one in four women are thinking to downscale um, in comparison to men. That that should not be, should not be the norm. Um, and the second thing which I would like to share from our Europe, European experience, what I also found really striking is that on a political level, um, in the institutions which were now created to deal with the corona crisis, all those crisis institutions, it's heavily, heavily men dominated. There is a complete imbalance. Um, so, and, and, and that leaves out a, a really big part um, of our society. And again, I think if we um, want to make our, our um, societies more resilient, for, and, and pre more agile um, and prevent crises and be better in crisis reaction, then we also need diversity. And again, not just gender diversity, but um, diversity in those crisis, crisis management and crisis prevention um, institution. And we need to rebalance that very quickly, I think. Caroline, you got us going now. I just have one more thing I want to yeah, add. Why not? To that. Yeah. Okay. I already received two questions, but please, oh, okay, please, great. Continue, I will just... please continue and then we will we okay. will take the uh, questions in. I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, I, I, I absolutely agree um, that we need to look at the ways, uh, Stormy, you articulated very well, the ways in which policy and infrastructure can support women staying in careers if that's what they want to do and advancing to more good living wage jobs and having a career ladder, if, you know, if, if that's what they want to do. And we know that many women do want that. In fact, also they need it because especially here, you need two incomes to be able to to support um, uh, your family. It's very hard to have a single uh, income to support a family here in the United States, especially in the Seattle region, given the cost of living. Um, and the statistics that you talked about also parallel with what we're seeing with lack of access to childcare. Prior to COVID in 2018, the Center for American Progress found that 40% of women, mothers, were more likely than the male partner to have felt the negative impacts of lack of access to childcare and how that negatively impacted their career. Now you flash forward to post-COVID and we're seeing at the national level, 40% of childcare is closed. 40% of facilities closed and worry that they're never gonna be able to reopen. Now in Seattle and in, in, in our county out here in King County, we've made sure that we have investments into child care facilities directly early on in COVID. That was one piece of legislation I was really proud to have passed early on, a COVID relief bill. And we see the statistics slightly less. It's about seven to 10% of child cares that have closed out here in Seattle. But that's still a huge worry when we already had a child care desert, when we didn't have enough access to child care to begin with. So 10% of an already um, you know, pool of child care that wasn't 
anywhere near the amount needed to meet the um, number of working family uh, and parents out there is an incredibly, uh, incredibly um, concerning statistic. When you couple that with who's left the job force, the worry that people had before COVID, the negative impact on their careers and income salary and salary, which then also compounds later on down the down the line when people don't have a pension, they don't have retirement security, and they don't have a way to um, have true economic stability uh, in in the out years because of decisions being made right now. So that's why I think childcare and investment in career ladders and supporting folks in you know especially in service sector jobs with having access to good wages there as well. You know, domestic workers, hotel workers, um, childcare workers who are more likely to be women. These are all policy areas that I've really spent a lot of time focused on because we need those jobs and we also want them to be respectable jobs that have good living wages because um, all jobs deserve respect and a living wage. So, the first question uh, in this year in Germany, we also have elections and um, after 16 years as Chancellor, Angela Merkel will not run for fifth term in 2021. What do you expect from her upcoming meeting with President Joe Biden in DC? What is her transatlantic legacy? What can we learn from her as a female leader? Should I have a go or? <laughs> um, yeah, if the, it was not directed uh, uh, to, yeah, to, I think both of you. It's a very interesting, interesting question. So Stormy, let's start. Um, well, first of all, um, I think that she is um, somebody who's perceived as somebody who, give, who, who is um, a picture of stability and reliability um, and a consensus forger, so to say. And I do have, a, I have to agree that this is something which, in which she had been really strong and especially over the last four years with all those super uncertainties going on internationally um, in, in global governance fora, I think that she really was a stability anchor. But people seldomly point out that she is also um, a agenda maker um, and that she also changed a lot of things. Um, and for example, she put a lot of a lot of issues which are um, which we didn't talk about today, but which are, I think also highly related to um, to be, uh, gender balances. For example, health issues. She put health issues right and square into the center of global governance initiatives of the G20 and the G7, for example. She did that also with regard to digital issues and artificial intelligence. Um, and another issue which is really so important for the workforce and also for, for gender, gender issues. So she, she actually also, um, I wouldn't call her progressive, um, but she, she, put, prog she progressively put issues onto the international governance agenda. I would, I would really give, give her that. Um, and she was one of the, in the whole league of, of, um, of advanced country leaders, she a lot of times was the only female. Um, and I, I really, I really uh, admire her for standing her ground in a very unexcitable way. Um, and then with, the, with this kind of humor she has, which you wouldn't suspect, but then there it is. Um, and, and, and that a lot of times helps to get, um, get across differences. Um, I think it was tougher over the last four years with President Trump, but there is a great uh, window of opportunity now to restart and re-kick, uh, re-kickstart the transatlantic relationship uh, on on, um, on environmental issues, um, on climate issues, on crisis prevention, um, on also tricky foreign policy issues. Um, so I think this is this is uh, those are the topics she's going to talk talk about with uh, President Biden. I think there's a lot a lot to learn from each other. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting who's going to be the, um, our, next, our next chancellor. Let, let, me, let me share a little anecdote with you, which has been widely shared in Germany. There was a mother sitting with her daughter in the um, U-Bahn, our subway system. And they were talking and then the little girl was saying, mom, is it actually possible for a man to, become, be, be, to become a chancellor? And um, I really like that because after all those male chances before her, um, I think she was she was 
people wouldn't call her that, but I think she was a breath of fresh, breath of fresh air um, from a gender perspective. Theresa, uh, perhaps you could also include what you expect from the meeting with President Joe Biden. Um, well, I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to is figuring out how um, the United States can both be held accountable for some of the uh, ways in which uh, the previous president, but also presidents in the past, have um, have not shown up on the global stage as much as we should. And I think that we have some uh, years to make up for with the Trump administration. So I'm, I'm eager to see how fast we can move forward with some progressive uh, partnerships and policies and know that the world is watching as we have a new administration that's come into office. I think there's a lot of hope and anticipation that we can, um, in terms of setting a new normal, set a new normal of how fast we can address some of the um, injustices that we see across the country and recognizing that it's not just um, good enough to return to sort of diplomacy um, from previous, from pre-Trump. We just, the, the type of injustices that we see both in terms of the income inequality and the racial disparities that we've talked about throughout the last hour here have only worsened in the last four to five years. And on the topic of where all of our countries need to step up, including especially the United States, how we can hold ourselves accountable to address climate injustice. I'm sitting here in Seattle, Washington that just has experienced its last three days of the highest record temperatures we've ever received over 108 degrees. Degrees uh, in uh, Fahrenheit, uh, with a city that has fewer than 42% of us having air conditioning, people lost their lives out here. So, uh, you know, let's um, let's let's be excited about a new administration and new partnerships that are possible. But let's not lose a beat with holding ourselves accountable for acting on the global stage on some of these true injustices that we see across the globe. And the last question. Uh, from the audience, from the chat. Um, does the severe sentencing of the white policeman who caused Floyd's death represent a big change in how non-white people are likely to be viewed in the future? I'll jump in first. Um, I think that there was a sense of relief, palpable relief when um, he was found guilty. I think a lot of people just expected the court and the jury to give him a pass, like so many other officers have been given a pass in, uh, in times before. I think that there was an expectation that he was going to be sentenced for a longer period of time. Um, but I also think that we cannot use this one example of whether or not justice has been served. Justice has not been served. Justice would be being able to have George Floyd be with his family. Justice would be Breonna Taylor being able to complete her degree. Justice would be, you know, Charlena Lyles here in Seattle, not having been shot by a police officer when she called for a mental health distress call. So justice is still, you know, um, very much uh, not accomplished yet. And justice cannot be uh, accomplished within just one individual's sentence or guilty conviction. Uh, I do think that there is um, hope that this has awakened folks' expectations about whether or not officers will be held accountable and what we are asking these armed officers to do in the United States. Armed policemen and women should not be showing up when there is a traffic infraction. People are dying in their cars because of lack of a blinker being hit in your car. People are dying in their cars because they have gone through a McDonald's drive through People are dying in their homes while sleeping like Charlene, like um, Breonna Taylor was. And people are being shot in front of their children like Charlene Lyles was here in Seattle um, for a mental health distress call. We do not need officers showing up where we actually need case managers and mental health counselors, folks who are gonna be able to connect people with housing. And um, hopefully um, we have begun a conversation out here that is you know, hundreds of years overdue about what uh, we should be asking these officers to do. 
But the reality, at least here in Seattle, uh, excuse me, at least here in the United States of what policing is, it, it, it has roots in our um, in our racist policies of the past of basically monitoring and um, incarcerating slaves. And we have to recognize this racist root and get to the, the heart of why we have such an unjust system and truly reform it, which requires us to make sure that there's investments in mental health, um, uh, counseling services, housing services, youth violence prevention services to do upstream investments so that folks hopefully never interact with officers in the first place. And then when they do, that we don't have officers showing up with a um, deadly weapon in cases where they really need to have uh, skills and training to help deescalate and also to connect folks with housing and mental health services when possible. So uh, I'm, I, I, I wanna underscore the importance of, of the court case and the sentencing, but also say we can't put all of our hopes and expectations on that one case when there's so much more to do across the country. Stormy, I saw that you uh, reacted a little bit critical in one moment, others uh, very like you agreed with what Teresa uh, said. What is your opinion? Um, uh, not not critical at all. So sorry. That I think that's the problem of such Zoom conferences. Yeah. Um, I um, one of your colleagues was writing in the chat function, and I was reading this, and I probably because I have bad eyesight, I was kind of like looking like this. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and what I would also like to point out is. Um, Joe Biden proposed a summit for democracies, right? Um, because in a lot of our countries, we are facing um, similar, well, somewhat different, but in a lot of senses also similar threats um, to our uh, to our democracies and to our to our societies. And this is something we also need to talk talk to each other about these challenges and try to learn from each other. And I think that um, the uh, the summit for democracies would be um, a venue or an event where issues like this, um, internal security, policing, and lots of other issues we talked talked about today could be placed on the agenda um, to um, not necessarily agree on a joint roadmap because all countries are somewhat different, but nonetheless really take the opportunity to, to learn from each other. And that's why I, I have to say, I also enjoyed this event today tremendously because I'm taking away lots, lots of ideas and lots of, lots of learnings. Um, so thank you so much for, for integrating me today. <laughs> we unfortunately extended already our time. We had time until, uh, 15 past, but still some uh, some some viewers, spectators of the audience is with us. Uh, so my last question um, to you, Teresa, because uh, you are the female change maker, how uh, you would encourage, motivate a young woman uh, today to become a female change maker? Thank you again for hosting this forum. I think that you have already inspired folks who've been watching this across the globe to be those change makers just by the sheer fact of, of this conversation. I hope folks see how Stormy is a change maker. Caroline, how you are a change maker and the work that I'm doing as well, making change. Um, you know, I, I would offer this. Uh, I do want more representative democracy. I do want people to see themselves in these seats of power. I want folks to know that they can sign on the dotted line and make those policy changes, and that can be you. But I also know that it's important to have an inside outside strategy. So, in addition to signing on the dotted line to make that policy change, you can be a change maker by standing on the strike line. You can be a change maker by going to the rallies. You can be a change maker by hearing what injustices are in your community and, and working to identify solutions and um, policy changes to push for as well. We all, I think, have a role in pushing for the change. Often governments can be in a reactionary position um, where they're responding to the call for an answer, the call for justice. So wherever you're at on that spectrum of being outside or inside, all of these seats are needed in order for us to push against the status quo and really create the change that we all need. The statistics that Stormy and I have shared today um, in terms of racial disparities and gender disparities exist in every country across this uh, globe. And so what I hope folks take away is the importance of us unifying and saying this 
pandemic affected our country. We have treated it as a true public health crisis. Now let's address the public health crises of racism and gender inequality and housing instability and income instability as the public health crises that they are. And together, let's work towards making changes that are needed. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much, Stormy, for being part of the hashtag Female Changemaker series. It was great to meet you. I hope that we will meet very soon live, not only online. Um, thank you so much for all your words and um, all this inspiring discussion. And for all of you who joined this discussion, you can also be part of the Female Changemaker series. Just tune in for the next talk. We will speak about Mexico and then we will continue with Iran, uh, with uh, the situation in Venezuela and Central Asia. So we will continue this series until the end of the year. And yeah, just click uh, the social media of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Landesbüro Baden-Württemberg and you will be informed. So thank you so much and have a great day. Have a nice evening. Um, to Berlin, to Seattle, and all around the world. Thank you so much. <laughs>